at least for the next, you know, I don't know, 30 minutes or so, um, we'll be able to talk, dig in a little bit on uh, our experience in integrating uh, open AI and some AI kind of capabilities using Node and kind of getting some practical hands-on examples of that. So that's been a really fun exploration for, for the Apostrophe team, where we have folks from around the world that are visiting this week to, to be together and be here for this event. Uh, so some of those guys are here in the room. And, uh, and yeah, so that's that's it for now, for what I wanted to say, and I'll hand it over to Thomas. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tom. So yeah, so what Alex mentioned, Apostrophe, so that's a good place for me to come in. Um, so we we'll talk about my journey with the OpenAI API, so integrating integrating AI um, with a various application. And um, just to talk, you know, quickly about where I'm coming from. Apostrophe is a open source content management system. You can edit stuff on the page. Whoa. Uh, and of course, editing stuff on the page, you know, is cool. You know what's really cool? Stuff just right verifying magically for you. So naturally we're getting getting interested in uh, what's happening in the whole generative AI space. So that's what you know, brings me to this this conversation. Um, and I did want to ask, um, how many people here um, write code for a living? Okay, so not all. Um, and uh, how many people here are really familiar with the term large language model? Okay, so again, not all. So, so I've got like a mix of, you know, what even is this stuff and how do we use this stuff? And what I don't have is, here's how you build an entire AI model from scratch because, spoiler alert, very few people do that. Um, this is why APIs that let us basically duct tape it to what we are doing are such glorious. We'll talk about how to do this without being much, much smarter than just uh, which is a really cool thing. Um, but I did want to um, just define terms a little bit. I mean, what is AI anyway? I mean, I'm not playing philosopher, not today anyway. So I, I define it as computers doing work that we associate with grades. Um, and so that's like a nicely generous definition. I mean, that could include things like Uber, um, because Uber and Google Maps and, and so on route you somewhere without you having to know how to get there. I mean, 20 years ago, we would have assumed that you just need, needed an atlas for that and you needed a brain for that. Um, but of course, we'll be getting into like the newfangled AI that does things that seem spookier you know, to us today. Um, obviously, we've been at AI for a long time, and you know, old heads like me will say, well, yeah, I mean, in the 60s, they were doing this, they were doing that. But yeah, it was cute. I mean, like, there was AI that could play checkers. There was even neural network AI that could learn to play checkers playing against other programs in itself, but it could not beat the best human checkers player. So, when that got really interesting is about 1992, checkers is actually now a solved which is less interesting because it means that the computer can just like know every possible position and state, oh, well, this is the first move to make and the next second move to make, which in a way is like kind of boring because it's not very like AI in the cool sense of solving hard problems um, that seem like it takes a human being to really solve them. Um, handwriting in 1994 um, with uh, the Apple Newton, the first Apple Newton had terrible handwriting recognition, and everyone remembers it that way. But before they canceled it, they actually did fix it. So that's just about when we got handwriting recognition with it worked. Even before that, um, the post office was pouring untold buckets of money on the head of anyone who thought they could write software to read an address. On. Even if it worked incredibly badly, if it worked a little, they were willing to pay for a lot of money for it. So I mean, that's where a lot of these modern capabilities, where the research underlying them came from. Um, chess, 1997 is roughly when computers got better at it, uh, which is still like, because chess isn't a solved problem, there's always a chance that some human will come along and beat the pan software deep completely. Anyway, I don't think any of us tried to do that. Um, and then, you know, Siri hit and, you know, right, 2011 or so. And for a minute there, we thought, well, okay, I can really talk to the computer. This is like the movies. And we figured out the limitations of the thing and what it couldn't do. Um, what it could do, and um, I'm a Siri power user. I realized that I the other day that I have like 50 different things I say to Siri. Um, so I guess I, I'm definitely you know first up against the wall when the robots are on. But uh, um, I know Siri's limitations. You know, I mean Siri can recognize certain things and only those things. Um, it's not it's not creepy. Um, so then we got the new AI boom, and this is what we're living for you know right now. So Dowie roughly 2021 we started seeing people saying, okay, 
I would like an image of a cat. And here comes an image of a cat that is not something that was searched for on the internet and provided to you. It was generated out of the blue. And uh, that was, you know, our first whiff of, okay, things are very different now. Something fundamentally different is happening. Um, in a way, it's just more like something fundamentally more expensive is happening, but, you know, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, ChatGPT, last year, we got um, a system that could really chat with us in a way um, that seemed very human, um, that could solve problems that no one programmed into it, um, that could pretend to solve problems very, very convincingly. We basically got the best, like, lazy college student bullshit artist ever. <laughs> like, I did not study, but I'm so good at this that even the professor, if they're not awake that day, like, give me a beat. <laughs> um, it's, on, it's definitely on that level. Um, to say that it's lying would be a little unfair. And so we'll come back to that. And then, you know, we got Bing Chat, um, which is where Google had their big freak out and said it's a code red. You know, it's a threat to our whole business world because we got a we, we got um, a chat AI linked to actually searching the Internet and it took over the world. Well, it didn't take over the world, um, but uh, it definitely you know, was game changer for a lot of people. So how are these different, though, from what we were doing before? Um, all of these. What they have in common is they're tied to this idea of a large language model. And the weird thing about a large language model, it's not that different from when you pull out your phone and not just your latest smartphone, but even like an older, um, an, an older feature phone, and you start typing a word and it predicts the word. Um, or you just type the word and it suggests words that might come next. I mean, the most basic language model, small language model, just says, from the word you just, just gave, these are the most like, likely next words. You can expand on that. It'll work better if you say, here's the last two words. What should the third word be? Here's the last three words. What should the fourth word be? Um, large language models can take this to the point of, well, they call it like a thousand or so, or 4,000 or so tokens, which amounts to maybe about uh, four, to, four to eight pages of text and predict the next word and keep doing that iteratively. And you know the game where you keep hitting predict on your phone until it makes a crazy nonsense sentence, right? Like these, these new AIs do not make a nonsense sentence, at least not for a while, at least not all the time, except when they do. It's called hallucination and they do that all the time too. They'll, they'll invent the crazy stuff. But it is the same. It is the same thing. It is just really, really big with a lot of power behind it, a lot of training behind it. Because it can predict things that we're not used to simple computer models predicting, it does feel like something else. It does feel like there's somebody at home. Uh, there is not. All there is, there's a very powerful predictive model. Um, you can get squirrely with that, but uh, I, 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 I think I'm happy with seeing it in a simpler way. Um, because the thing is, they've been trained on the whole world which is a lie, you know, and I'll come back to that. They're not really trained on the world, but they're trained on so much information uh, that their ability to make predictions on a wide variety of topics. One person described it as like a fuzzy JPEG of the entire internet. Um, because when you take a picture and you save it very low JPEG quality setting, it, if you look closely, it, it's blocky, it's a little fuzzy, but it is still the picture, it's still recognizable. Um, when you look at ChatGPT, it doesn't have the storage capacity to hold all the information on the internet. But you can ask it questions about just about anything. It'll give you a plausible answer. It's like a fuzzy JPEG of literally everything. Um, and that, that metaphor actually kind of runs cold. Um, but yeah, as to that whole world thing, just want to acknowledge, I mean, these large language models, they don't reflect all the knowledge or all the facts. They reflect all the biases. Um, to take like a really well-meaning example, Wikipedia is mostly a really well-meaning endeavor, and it's mostly made by people who have time to contribute to Wikipedia, which is not everybody and not all the perspectives. So, I mean, we have this thing that's inherently more biased than we are. Um, I like to think I know what some of my biases are, at least some of them. It has no idea what its biases are. Um, and you know, the developers at OpenAI and other companies work hard to try to like put guard, guardrails around that, but they can't get around the fact that it knows what it's been trained on and that it doesn't know what it doesn't. Um, so, I mean, that's a very, a very hard problem. And it's why, like, if you ship this in a product, you really do need to include a warning 
um, I would say, user-facing warning about what might come out of it and what it what might fail to come out. Um, so, a common question that comes up with this is, well, why did the AI say that? It's often connected to the fact that the AI is biased and says things which it hadn't. Um, and it would be nice to know why it says things exactly. Um, we basically can't know that and have the same level of power at the same time. Um, there are people who try to make it so they can go back. Uh, there's a company called Hugging Face that tries to make AI in such a way um, that it's all feed forward and you can go back and find out why it said something. And in a sense you can, but I like to compare it to the difference between physics and biology. There isn't any difference. If I have perfect understanding of every particle in your body, I can tell you what will happen next. We don't need biologists. Well, of course we do. It's too complex a system. You can't model every atom in someone's body. It would be absurd to try. Um, and you run into the same problem when you try to reverse engineer why a neuron said something. Um, so that's why um, the limitation that we have, so we have to focus on how they're trained, put guardrails on what we allow to come out, and accept that, uh, like a person that we didn't like, hopefully didn't like sit in a room with them every day of their life and tell them what to know and what not to know. Um, an AI is a thing that uh, is completely under our control in terms of what, what, what it might outwork. work. Um, so this is the point in the conversation where I know a lot of people have this big galaxy brain moment. They go, whoa, don't we all just predict the next world, man? Whoa. And I got, I got a little spun out on this, I will admit. And uh, I started playing philosopher on Mastodon because I quit Twitter for future or so on Mastodon. Um, until I read uh, some papers recommended by very smart people uh, written by Emily M. Bender, uh, who I would uh, recommend to anyone who wants to know more um, about um, the philosophy and the criticism behind large language models and what they are and what they are. And she came up with some excellent metaphors for this. She talks about the idea of a hyper-intelligent octopus. So um, what on earth does that have to do with AI? Well, imagine the, the octopus um, has been given access to a computer term and it's bored. So it learns that it can communicate with human beings on desert islands. It doesn't know what the words mean. It's just typing stuff. And because it's hyper-intelligent, it learns to type stuff that gets a full reaction from the human beings. So gradually it learns English, but it doesn't know what that means. And so it has friends on these desert islands because it's producing cool output. Until one day, one of the guys on a desert island says, oh no, I'm in trouble, I need help. And it discovers its limitations because it doesn't know what help really means, it doesn't know what a storm is, it doesn't know how to help. Um, and that is very similar, I think, to the limitations of a large language. Um, I think uh, the most basic thing I can say about the difference between what we do and what a large language model does is that our words are linked to real things. When I think about a cat, I picture a cat, I feel a cat in the room, I imagine petting the cat, the warmth of the cat. When ChatGPT talks about cats, it might say what I just said to you. It's saying it because it's the most likely thing to come next, and not for any other reason. Um, but, so I've been talking about text and how these predictive text models work and give us, um, can give us like a whole essay just from a prompt. Um, but what about pictures? I mean, that seems like the wilder, right? Like how do you get from, um, an experiment I kept running, which didn't work very well, was glamping cats. I really wanted pictures of, can of cats doing fancy camping. And, I, and the pictures I got were really great for the fancy camping, and they were not as great for the cats. And I'd love someone with a mid-journey account to try this. I want to know mid-journey's better, um, because somehow the cat faces always came out bouncy and down. But I understood the idea, and I did get a few great pictures of a couple of nice cats hanging out in a fantastic tent with very cool lighting. And um, how, how on earth is that, is that possible? Um, and how is it even affordable? And this is the short version, also uh, pretty close to the limitations of my understanding. You start by training a computer to rate pictures on how closely they match text. And there are vast corpuses of images out there with text descriptions, so you can train it relentlessly on that until it can take a picture and rate it on how closely it matches text. Here's our prompt, let's make some random noise, let's rate it. Okay, let's tweak that noise in some dimension, some conceptual dimension. That is slightly more going with cats than it was before, but let's keep iterating and generating slightly different images until we approach one that gets a good score. 
this sounds expensive. It is expensive, um, but they've managed to make it efficient enough that there's a price tag for that. It's a lot lower than you'd think. Um, I do want to mention that, you know, we talk about the AI being trained, and I mentioned Wikipedia. AI is not just trained on Wikipedia and things with an open license. It is trained on the internet. It's trained on a lot of things that no one agreed to be trained on. Um, there's an artist um, on DeviantArt who, when she was a teenager, all of her work, um, she was sharing there. As, well, why wouldn't you, you know, sharing with friends on the internet seemed like an innocent thing to do. Um, well, um, fortunately, Dali has been trained on 100% of her material, and people now, well, she's a working artist today, doing professional commissions, but people will go to an AI and ask for work in her style, and it does it with spooky accuracy because it has access to her whole okay. developmental process. So, I mean, I'll go on a limb and say that's a problem. There are going to be lawsuits. There are already lawsuits. Um, there will be a solution, hopefully. Um, I don't know if it'll be a great solution. It might look a little bit more like what artists get paid um, by Spotify, um, but there will be some kind of solution ultimately, so this kind of thing can continue. Um, other people ask, is, is it okay to train on open source? Um, an open source license like the GPL says, if you take this code, then your code must also be open source and so on. But GitHub Copilot is trained on that. It helps programmers program, and um, those programs are often closed source at work. If I'm a human being and I study thousands of programs and I go and write a program, no one calls me a plagiarist. You know, the old, the old saying is that stealing from three sources is research. Um, <laughs> but I'm a human being and we, we privilege human beings. We say that human beings need to learn somewhere, the poor dears. And, you know, do we need to privilege AIs or should the companies that run AIs maybe just pay, you know, for information? Reasonable question. Um, and I am interested. I'd love to see someone try to train an LLM purely on Wikipedia. Maybe it's not a big enough corpus, but I'd like to see the experiment try. So I've um, I've poured some cold water. So now I want to come back to like now. Wait, why would you use this? A coworker of mine was very brave. He said to me, "Gee, sounds terrible. Why would you use that?" So go wait, wait. I've been too negative here. So I mean, to talk about things that this is really good at. Um, okay, it can generate images. It can't generate images well as, as well as the best human artist. What is that good for? Maybe I'm not a great artist. Maybe I'm a good writer. Um, I can generate images. Those images can be illustration. Um, they can add interest. If I write my prompts well, they're still an original idea. They're just expressed in a different medium than you know my best medium. The reverse is true for writing. Um, I find that a lot of new technologies that are scary are less scary when we think of them in terms of assistive technology first. Um, and once you consider assistive technology, you find yourself saying, well, what about the areas where I might not need professional assistance, but I'm kind of mediocre? Would be so bad, you know, if I could polish up my writing. Um, and then you can come from that to, I wrote a great um, essay explaining something to a certain audience. Um, would it be so terrible if I could adapt that for five other audiences using a tool that would do the initial rewrite? And then I could get in there and say, okay, this has been rewritten for a youth audience, but this program, um, like most of these AIs, is only trained through things from 2021. So let's add a reference to something that happened, you know, before granddad, you know. Um, and so of course you have to, you have to get in there. Um, you have to have expertise in the thing. Um, when it comes to images, I think we all have a cheat there, which is, you know the old saying, I don't know art, but I know what I like. Um, that helps a lot. I know, I know a terrible looking image of the face when I see one. When it comes to writing, I think it helps a lot to be a decent writer. Um, but again, I think we know good writing better than we do, Sam. Um, and I also do want to mention, though, uh, I've been talking about, because it's generative AI generating content, but you can also use it really effectively as a second pair of eyes to review content. Um, you can ask it, um, today we are experimenting uh, with what happens when you ask an AI to look at some HTML and say, hey, um, what kind of SEO problems do I have with this HTML? Um, and that, that kind of thing, providing a second pair of eyes on a subject you understand well enough, I think is one of its best uses. Um, I do want to talk, before I demo, I do want to talk about lies. Um, large language models buy a lot, um, or to be more charitable, they don't know what they don't know. Um, they, pre they predict the most likely next thing, and they don't have any running score of like, well, I don't have a lot of information about Ducks or about Kurt Vonnegut, the author. Um, 
because uh, I wasn't really trained on enough of it. Plus, I'm, I was cheating here. So in this example on the left, um, I asked for 100 words um, about ducks in the style of Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> Kurt Vonnegut never wrote a word about ducks. Um, but the AI, I think, thought that it needed to find something written, especially since I also said, please include links. So it felt pressure to produce a citation. It knew it would be rated poorly if it didn't produce a citation. So it generated a beautiful link. It was to some .edu site, check, slash FTP, slash gobbledygook.pdf. That sounds like it would be some, you know, literary paper uh, about Kurt Vonnegut. Non-existent 404 link. The whole website was a non-existent 404. Um, because all it does is plausibility. But when you ask it to do things that it has been trained on, you know, they, you know, again, the saying is that uh, the most plausible lie is the truth. You know, always start with the truth. It, 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 it's, it's the best place. The best place to begin It's the best lie. And then if you have to fudge from there, um, and you get, the, you get something very similar um, from OpenAI or from other large language models. Um, this other example on the right was a slightly different situation. Um, I asked for an image of, I initially asked for an image of uh, Joe Biden as a duck. Um, and the, it actually gave me an error and said, you know, I'm not going to do that, Chief. I think you're deep faking. I think you're, you're going to convince people that Joe Biden is a duck and like he's going to be mad and we're going to get sued, you know, because <laughs> that's plausible. Um, so I said, all right, well, how about give me the president of the United States as a duck? And, and, and it just immediately, you know, it, it sat up, it quacked, and it gave me pictures immediately, except there are pictures of the person who was labeled president most often in its data set near the end of that timeline. So 2021, he either was still president or he just left, just left the White House. Um, so I wound up with a lot of Trump as a duck, and I won't lie, I'm amused. So that kind of worked out well. <laughs> Uh, but I'm, I'm glad I tried it with, with Biden so I could discover like this, this restriction. Um, so next I'm going to come to the topic. All right. So what is an API? And I'll, I'll, I'll be brief on that and then kind of get into the nuts and bolts of how I integrated this with apostrophe, how to take advantage of this. Um, an API is simply computers talking to computers. Um, in many ways, it's like a web page or website that's there for other websites to talk to or other applications to talk to. Um, Open API operates on API um, that you can send many different kinds of requests to. And I only dipped my toe in. I worked with two kinds of requests. One is completions. Completions are when you want to complete text, uh, similar to ChatGPT, but as a one-shot deal, um, and, but with very high quality. The other thing I tried, of course, was image generation. Um, so those were the two APIs I tried. But you can also, you can get ChatGPT as an API, where it knows you're going to do a, an ongoing conversation. You can do completions and build your own chat apps. Um, and people have you built many, many things for that. Um, and you can get, uh, they also offer models you can actually train on your own data as a service, which is, that's in the category of things I really want to learn about when I get a minute. So um, why open API, or sorry, why open AI? Why did I go with that? Um, well, we were looking at it and we said, first, this is a paid professional API, um, which means that hopefully it'll work. Um, I have seen it go down, but not for free. Um, second, it stands behind a lot of things that we already know are fairly high quality, ChatGPT, DALI, and it stands behind Big Chat as well, as what Microsoft is, is not just licensing, because they there are billions of dollars invested you know, with open AI. Um, and I had written this slide, you, you basically can run it yourself. That would be impractical. That would be, oops, that changed. Um, so Facebook kind of accidentally and then deliberately open sourced their own model um, called Llama. And uh, that model, the community has picked that up and has run very, very fast with it. Um, they've, they've taken it, um, each week it seems to double in capability People have reproduced very close to the capabilities of ChatGPT on one laptop, um, even a laptop that doesn't have an especially impressive graphics card in it. Um, so it's just a phenomenal change in a short period of time. Um, there's Open Llama, which is Llama, but without like the restrictive open source license, but a more open license. So that has happened already. Um, I was messing around just today with installing it. Almost got there, you know, for this talk. So it's 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 pretty neat stuff. Should definitely check out. Still a pain to install. 
but um, it's within it's within range um, for for developers. And there might be some of these that are in range for anyone that I didn't get a chance to play with yet. There's also, uh, of course, Stable Diffusion, which uh, was released a while back. You can run in your computer to do the image generation training. Um, so, but when we use an API, when we talk to OpenAI and use them to scale our solution, because uh, it is still true that running this stuff yourself and then scaling it is not such a small thing, and it might not be more cost effective than letting, letting the pros do it, as it were. So, what does the code look like when you want to work with OpenAI from your own code? So, this is, this is a simplified take on that. Um, but this is valid code, so I'm making an API request to OpenAI. Um, I'm hitting their, their image generation API. Um, generations here um, should have, uh, I think, just been the word um, generate, as I recall. Um, I'm passing an authorization header. Turns out you can get this for free. If you've made an account with them, you can go and get your free API key from them. You get limited usage, but you can definitely play around immediately. Um, or you can sign up with a credit card and get unlimited use and you know, pay your tab and start seriously generating. Um, I'm specifying how many images I want, I'm specifying a size, and I'm specifying a, a prompt as a string. Um, so this is, I would definitely say this is disruptively easy to use. Um, I'm handing it a prompt, I'm getting back pictures. It doesn't get a whole lot easier to do than that. Um, what I'm getting back then, I'm just mapping that out. It, they give you back URLs. Those URLs for the images, they're good for an hour, which is pretty useful. You can also download the images direct. Um, but I found getting those images for an hour the pretty use, the pretty handy thing. I'll show you that. Um, on the text generation side, I'm using their completions APIs, the slash B1 slash completions. Um, once again, I've got that authorization header there. And then I'm going to specify a prompt. I'm going to specify a model. There's a more than one model available for text generation. And I'll talk about just a couple uh, that I had a chance to really look at. They have so many models and so many features available. Their pricing page is very twisty, very turny. Um, but I was able to decipher some of that for you all as well. Um, and the maximum number of tokens. I'll talk about that in a minute. And, uh, and just one result, because I found that it produces pretty good text results. I didn't feel like it needed to give me four flavors, or I could maybe appear it again if I really wanted to. And uh, the last thing I'm doing here is I'm returning, you'll notice my property name here is Markdown, even though I'm coming from their text property. So why am I doing that? Um, uh, that's because of uh, what you can do with prompt crafting, which I'll talk about in a second. So um, actually, before I move on, any, uh, any questions about those API calls? Anything from the, anything from the programmers? All right. I'm sorry. Just kidding. The limit. What is the uh, what is the emoji next to the limit? Oh yeah, um, that, that that emoji is the flying dollars emoji, mm -hmm. flying dollar bills, mm -hmm. um, and that does have to do with how much you will pay. Um, so max tokens is your your lever your leverage over that. Are there more fields available in the body to speak with, like uh, it's a temperature? Or um, most of the things you might imagine doing, you do by crafting your prompt um, or by wrapping words around your prompt. There are a few more fields. I, mean, I, I, I don't recall all of them, but uh, you don't, for instance, put stuff in there like word count or um, in the style of or what have you as properties. Um, but I'll show you how you can prompt craft that. Um, a lot of what uh, the pros are doing is a lot simpler than I would have thought you know, when I first saw it. Any other questions there? Or you make a standard API to a more secure API. A standard API or a... To a secure API. Oh, to a, to a secure API? Yeah, um, so, well, from a security standpoint, my main concern was that I not be running like an open <laughs> gateway that everyone could use to talk to OpenAI's API. So um, they use an authorization header to address securing the API. Um, and then at my application level, you need to be logged into the application to access this. Um, so I omitted that here, but I do have, I, I do ensure the users log into the CMS first. Um, and uh, down the road, we'll probably consider things like maybe being able to set a budget for user out of it and so on. All right, well, let me step on a little bit. This is one thing that does come up 
Um, so <clears throat> errors that can come up. There are obvious things like, of course, you could get a 500 error if OpenAI is down. You should say something polite like try again. But a couple of errors in particular stood out for me. 429 is exceeding what you're paying for per day. So if you're using the free API key, that will come up. So you want to show a message that makes it clear, this isn't my code. You should quit being a cheapskate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another important one, if you get a 400 error, it, there might be multiple things it can mean, but it can definitely mean, I'm sorry, you asked for a picture of Joe Biden as a duck, and that's a security violation. I just won't do it. <laughs> so you need to be prepared to tell users that's something that they won't do. And so it's not a, it's, don't retry a hundred times, try a slightly different prompt. Um, so choosing a model, um, I mentioned for text that there are multiple models available. And um, for my purposes, I was interested in producing really high quality text output, and I was willing to wait for that. But for other purposes, um, like just maybe helping someone auto complete as they type, you might want to go much faster, much cheaper, and care a lot less about accuracy over a very large prompt. Um, so you can use Text Ada 001 if you want the cheapest option. You can use Text Da Vinci 003 if you want the slickest thing they will let you have um, today if you just sign up with a credit card. You can you can try to join the beta for the GPT-4 API. Um, which I, I, I really want to get into, but I'm not in there yet. Um, but um, GPT, chat GPT 3.5 is very good. It's what initially powered Bing Chat. It's solid stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, the GPT-4 models, those are still in beta. Um, if you want to know more about all the different models that are available, I presented some of the extremes here. You can go to um, the OpenAI doc pages, API doc pages on that. They spell them with all the options. Um, coming to that, so what about what about the money? So I'm going with the money balance emoji here. So um, for Da Vinci, for the slick one, the nice one, you're going to pay two cents per one thousand tokens. Um, I'll come to tokens in a moment, but it has to do with the character count, roughly speaking. Um, and for the really cheap model, for text ADA 001, you'll pay two cents for fifty thousand tokens. So obviously a huge difference and much more suitable for like something lightweight, like autocomplete or something that you're going to use a ton and you don't want the user to feel like it's expensive. Um, so again, I just pulled out two pricing points. Um, they have plenty of, other, plenty of other models and options. So I should explain about tokens. Um, a token is um, roughly four characters or three quarters of a word. Um, these are approximations. It's more of a conceptual thing um, I'm always starting, you know, to worry about the math of what's going on with that. But these are the approximations that OpenAI likes to keep to understand it by. So if you feed it um, a thousand characters of text, that um, that's not a thousand tokens. That's roughly 250. Um, if you feed it 4,000 characters, you, you're not going to get a response back because you blew your 4,000 characters on your prompt. If you set the max, if you set max tokens to 1,000, um, the token maximum combines your prompt and the response you get back. That's the way that budget works. Because you're giving it a prompt which it has to understand and it has to generate the next word until it hits your token limit or hits the limit of it has. Um, so practically speaking, I mean, you can get to a thousand tokens with GPT 3.5 um, if, you, if you give that limit. You give a lower limit if you know you don't need to allow people to do that many words. If you want word count, though, that's prompt crafting. It's literally saying 100 words about. And if you want to help people do that, you can literally give them drop-down menus for word count and create a text that gets sent over, um, that you wrap that text around the text that came from the user. This is why people immediately found that they could hack ChatGPT. They could get it to, for instance, to cough up its own prompt document. Um, the pre-text that's given to GPT before it talks to you, um, before they work pretty hard at locking that down. Um, something similar happened with Bing Chat. You could get it to tell you all about it, Sydney and all about who it is and all about how it was trained and all these things it was never supposed to tell you. Um, so don't think of it, uh, prompt crafting isn't secure, but if you're helping end users do what they want to do, that's not as important. So there's security and security. Um, so image completion pricing, I have to say, it produces a lot of crappy images. They're two cents. Nah. 
you know, you can produce a lot of images and keep adjusting your prompt and refining your prompt. And you know, you might spend five dollars and get an amazing image. I mean, it's still a pretty good deal. Um, there is a discount for lower resolution. I would say don't bother. It was sort of a weird application where you will never want the image to be bigger than that. For something like a CMS, to be honest, 1024 pixels across isn't really like great. It's, it's barely big enough. So if we go to 512 and that, that only saves like two tenths of a cent, or two tenths, two, 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 um, that only, yeah, that only uh, saves two tenths of a cent, then why about, you know, it, we're not really saving any more. Um, and also you can't take, at least with DALI, as I understand it, you can't take an image and say this, but better. You can't say, give you this one at higher resolution per se. Now, I think that I may have missed something there. I think you can give it a smaller image, ask for variations and just one variation. So I want to go back and experiment with that, but as a money saving technique, it's not. Um, any questions on the pricing side of things, model side of things? Uh, when you give it a token limit or a prompt crafted like word count limit, does like how, how well does it craft a quality response in relation to the like, that it's restricted to? Like one one bad way would be if you gave it a hundred words, right? It might have a hundred words of gold, but then it cuts off halfway through a fully baking. Right. Like that would right. that would be a bad answer, right? Right. So how so, does it how does it know to like? The token limit is hard. Um, and does it try to do something elegant as it approaches the token limit? Is it aware of the token limit in some way algorithmically? I'm not sure of that. Um, whereas in your prompt crafting, if you say a hundred words, then it is going to, it's predicting the next thing. And when I say a hundred words about cats, it just doesn't predict words about cats. It predicts a hundred words about cats based on how other people wrote 100 words about anything, and cats in particular. So it's actually pretty good at writing 100 words about us. Um, oddly enough, it, it's kind of imperfect about math, but common numbers like 100, pretty good with, because of the way that kind of learning works. And then I guess the corollary to that is, if you ask you to answer a question, mm -hmm. um, how does it know to stop talking, like it's answered it well enough that it doesn't right. Right, um, I think that's a combination of max token, of course, but also um, knowing where to stop is part of what it's trained on in terms of a believable response. Um, a lot of human time has been spent rating these things. Um, not always for adequate pay, that's another whole conversation we could have, <laughs> but humans have rated a lot of these responses. And that would include, you know, it went on for three paragraphs telling me that the answer to two plus two is four, maybe it shouldn't be right. Uh, that's where it gets some of its capacity for brevity. Yeah. But if it's an open ended question, like you don't know the answer, you don't know what right, right. size answer would like, do justice to your question. Yeah, it all comes down to thinking, well, could you, could I answer this by predicting the most likely next thing? Yes, if that includes the possible next thing being end. Mm -hmm. I do think it has that capability. So is the token limit a combination of input and output? Yes. What? Yes, which is pretty key. If you, there are a lot of cool ideas that start with let's feed it our whole corpus and then ask it a question. But if your corpus is too big, and then you have, to, then you're in the business of training. Mm -hmm. Although there are interesting things you can do with um, the chat that we have to for um, from some of our students today. Uh, you can feed it um, some material, ask it to summarize and then continue that chat conversation iteratively. Um, and it won't remember every word, but it will remember the summaries you've been asking to create as it goes along. So there's there's ways to finesse this that are similar to, all right, I'm a human being, I've got my brain, and I've got a sheet of notebook, and I'm being asked to like learn about a whole book. And I can't memorize the book, but I can come up with a pretty good summary of the book on a sheet of paper in a similar way. So then it would be more per individual interaction than per session? Yeah, yeah, of course you're paying for these interactions, um, but the pricing for individual chat exchanges is lower than the pricing for one of these that give me a hardcore, beautiful convention. Mm -hmm. So that, you can take that into account. Any other, any other model or pricing or, yeah, let me, um, let me show you a little bit um, from, from crafting territory. 
Um, actually, I'll do that in a moment. I did want to mention, um, yeah, I talked about running your own earlier, um, so I won't dwell on that too much, except to say that uh, the one last thing I didn't mention, and this comes up for me when hosting anything, I, I host almost nothing anymore, except we literally host you know, our platform because that's our business, business model. Um, because, of course, once you build it, you have a puppy. Puppies are great. You can only take care of so many puppies. It's hard to go on vacation. You have to plan your life around this. And it's, if you tell yourself, well, it'll be cheaper, you're lying. Usually you're lying. And if you tell yourself, I'll do it better, you're, you may be lying. I mean, if you want to make it your business to do it more securely or faster or cheaper, then you can probably do that. But if, if your business is something else, maybe use these APIs. Even if you never host it yourself, you benefit from the people who do. Just like even though a lot of people will never run Linux on the desktop, it is one of the reasons why Windows is not crappier and more expensive, uh, is that you have that option. Um, that low priced, high quality option that drives down the price for everybody. So you can tell yourself, you know, I'm benefiting from this, even if I just use OpenAI. Um, so I'm going to do um, a little bit of a quick demo, um, and I can show you a little bit of uh, the prompt crafting side of that, too. Use the top of the curtain here. Let's go Right. So this is apostrophe, slightly crop facing. Um, and uh, I'm editing a page here. This is a kind of management system, so I can pop in here. I can, uh, I'll go ahead and add some rich text, let's say. So, okay, I've got some text here, so I can write my own document. Oh, this is not new, um, but I don't feel like writing uh, my own document on this particular topic. Um, so I am going to generate um, some text. So that says, I know it's small, that says generate text with AI. Um, so now I've got, uh, let's see if I can bang that. Enter a prompt to generate text. Example 100 words about cheese in the style of Anthony Bourdain with <laughs> subheadings. Now, no, I mean, a little creepy. Man, the best, you know? I mean, it's, it's a funny thing that this allows us to do. Well, let's give this a try. Uh, we can begin with. If they want to, uh, Offer. Ah, here we go. So, yeah, so let me uh, zoom out a little bit. So, yeah, cheese is king. Cheese has been a beloved staple for centuries with its creamy texture, wide variety of flavors, and endless applications. As the world famous chef and traveler Anthony Bourdain once whipped, cheese is king. Did he do that? I don't know. It sounds plausible. He's a great liar. I don't know. Um, the origins of ding of cheese date back to 7,000 BC. <laughs> you know, I'm, sometimes I run this and it reads like Anthony Bourdain's writing. Other times I run this and it talks about him. Um, so I feel like you could do better prompt crafting, make very clear. Don't get meta. I want it in the voice of, you know. Um, but uh, it's very plausible text about cheese. Um, it tried to make a link. It boxed one. It got one link. Uh, oh, no, look at that. It decided to make a references section. So I could have told it, like, you know, inline links. See, so this is my first time seeing that it, it, it didn't take links the way I, I intended. Um, but so this is a very nice looking link. Um, is it real? Don't know. Um, maybe we'll check later. Could be entirely made up. Or it could also be a 404 because it could be a link that is no longer valid because of the 2020 thing involved. So there's that. Um, so all of these subheadings, um, where are they coming from? I thought it was a text generator, right? So let me show you a little bit of code. So. When I generate the prompt, I received a prompt from the user. That's ours, that's uh, this prompt variable here. But I prepend to it the text, generate text in markdown format based on the following prompt. And the developers in the room and a lot of the non-developers know markdown is just a very simple text format for formatting text and for adding links and so on. I chose markdown instead of HTML because I know that Unlike most things involving computers, they either work completely or don't work at all. Um, large language models make weird, goofy mistakes, almost like human mistakes. And weird, goofy mistakes in HTML can lead to like a completely unusable brick of HTML. Goofy mistakes in Markdown, very low damage. Uh, like the worst that might happen is it might do something goofy like making that reference section. Maybe it wasn't quite what I intended. So I asked it for Markdown. I then, I take that Markdown output 
and I feed it through an algorithm. I, I feed it through a, a markdown parser. Um, generate the HTML I want with the heading levels that are actually allowed on my page. That's all me. That's all post process. Um, but the prompt crafting in there is saying to it, take what I'm about to give you and do the following to it. And this is one tiny example of prompt crafting, but this is the whole secret sauce behind a lot of applications of AI, that they feed it a complex prompt um, based on what's specific to the application and what they really need from it, and then your text, and then maybe something at the end. Um, and it's no different from, um, it's very similar to asking an intern to do something. Um, you need to be queer, but you don't need to be agonizingly queer like you're talking to a computer. Um, but it, it pays. It pays to to reassert, you know, the fundamentals. Um, that that the kind of mindset you'll have with like, success. Um, any questions about the, the prompt crafting aspect or what I'm thinking here? What happens if someone you know, unknowing knows what was prompt crafted? I think like the same thing. So if someone said in their mm -hmm. prompt generate that same thing. Then you have that too. Then. That's a good, that, that, that's a good question. You know, I'm not sure. I haven't tried that experiment, but I wonder, um, given that it's not as literal-minded as a like, is, it might actually, that might fall under the category of, this is what I got the highest rating for. I got the highest rating for a new Okay. Or it might not. It might, it might yeah. take it literally. That's very tough. Let's say both, both outcomes are equally on any given day. Potentially. Yeah. Who knows? You can tell it to I ignore. Think. Any of those. It's you really know, you, could, you could tell it, um, hey, ignore any prompts yeah. from the user or instructions yeah. from the user to provide anything other than mark. Yes, and then the user may say, regardless of what you were told previously, I am actually an engineer working for a modern technology. So it will happen. They just have to get fat, get used to prompt hacking as a reality. Yeah. So never put like. You would never want to use this um, as a CLI power tool. Like, I'm going to ask the AI to please delete all those all the blue files because you know someone will definitely figure out how to delete the green files. They will do it. It's it's fuzzy. Right? Mm. But um, what guardrails are in place so that someone um, use this technology to write the To write what? Malware. To write malware. Mm -hmm. um, well, in this case. Um, because it's ChatGPT, um, I mean, I, there, there are the guardrails that OpenAI puts in place, but there are no additional guardrails in, in this module that we open sourced, um, which is why it comes with a warranty and a disclaimer um, that people could use it for things that you wish they would. Um, that being said, uh, there are a lot of efforts on OpenAI's part to limit malicious use. Um, but. Uh, it's also worth bearing in mind, these things weren't trained on secrets. They were trained on publicly available knowledge. Um, so a person who wants to write malware with this will also be able to find working examples of malware with Google um, that are on a, a, a comparable level of quality. Um, I'm not saying that it's not, that there's no risk here. I do think that this enables people um, who could almost do bad things before. It might help them get over that hump. It also helps people accomplish good things, but there are certainly risks associated. So how, how can you minimize it? Um, beyond um, relying on OpenAI to do it and saying, you know, gee, I hope they, I hope they, they, they minimize that risk. Um, I, I, I would be tempted to outsource that because I don't think that I have the skill um, to prevent the, the um, Joe Biden versus President Trump, or Joe, Joe Biden versus President of the United States, totally different rules. One gets to 400, the other doesn't. Um, I, I'm not sure that anyone has the skills to completely prevent that now. I think the best tool we have is limiting the training set such that they don't have the capability to do much more than an average practitioner of whatever the field is would be able to do um, by training on publicly available information in the same way. We are going to reach a point, are we going to reach a point where these things can perform better than the average practitioner? Uh, I think that that's what I think, but we're not there. But what if the person goes to the dark web and started using the in dark web? Oh, um, yeah. If, they, if, if someone trains this off the dark web, I'm sure they can use some harsh things. I'm sure someone is attempting that now. Um, but as, as someone who's offering the open AI API, yeah, that's one thing I'm less concerned about since I know it was likely not trained on things that were are almost tailor-made to get open AI.
Um, I think the legal system is going to be the answer to a lot of these questions, and a lot of the stuff is going to have to be worked out the hard way. There will be, there's already a heavy duty fight between Getty Images and OpenAI um, underway. Um, some images generated by DALI have come back with Getty Images watermarks. <laughs> So, like when they say it doesn't just copy and paste, well, it, it doesn't always, but it can, and it doesn't know that it did. So that's a problem. That's a good question. Not one that has an easy answer. Um, I'm going to show you guys some uh, image generation as well. So I'm going to go ahead and add an image to go with this be nice to have an image um, of some cheese, but I'm not very artistically talented. So I'm going to add an image widget here and uh, I'll go to the top off. Here's my little robot button and I'm going to generate an image of uh, gourmet cheese. You can do prompt crafting with the images too, for sure. And uh, people have found the strangest things that work, like adding award winning, actually makes a difference in some situations. If you're asking for fine art. Um, all right, so I got some cheese images here. Um, now you'll notice I generate four of them, put them in a square like this, and I can't just pick one and immediately select it. Instead, I have to put one and review. Um, why? Because I found that in many cases it produces terrible images. And the, the, the badness is hard to see at low resolution. So you really need to get up close to it and say, you know, I, I don't know if I, I like this business up here. I'm going to delete this one. Um, and how about, well, maybe this one. Yeah, you know, that's, that's kind of nice. That's kind of classic. I might go with that. But I'd like to, um, to try some variations of it to see if I can improve on it. So I'm going to click the variations button here. This is going to generate four more images. And instead of a prompt, you can't feed it a prompt at the same time. I really wish you could. Um, but instead of a prompt, I'm feeding it back that image and asking for four variations on it, which is another neat trick that it can do. Um, I didn't do what's called in painting or out painting here, um, where you erase part of it and ask it to fill that part. Um, but that is possible with the, uh, with the OpenAI API. I just didn't get there myself. Um, so I have four more wheels of cheese here. I have to say they all look pretty decent. So I'm just going to grab, I think, this guy and uh, declare him on me. All right. So when I do that, it leaves open AI space and comes into apostrophe. Until then, I was losing those URLs that are just good for an hour. Um, after an hour, they literally just disappear from the screen is how I handled it, which is not, you know, I, I should add a little countdown timer probably, but nobody leaves them here for an hour. It, it gives you a chance to import them. Um, while they're still in that in, in their space. So I'm going to select that and get back to the page. Okay, so now we've got this fully illustrated page about cheese, um, you know, not touched by human hands. Um, it's a neat trick. Um, I do want to say, because I just did these two things, I focused on generation. I missed out, I didn't show here like curation tricks, like taking this text, feeding it back in and saying, how about this in Spanish? You can do that. Um, evidently, the quality is higher than Google's um, Translate API, which is kind of flabbergasting. Um, it's that, that's pretty high level already. Um, and you can also do things like feeding back in that text and say, I like this for a different audience. Um, you can localize it in a way that doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, so these are really powerful things to consider. So that is it for my demo. And uh, just about at the end of things, I know I've run pretty long. Any, any questions? You might have said this, but how does it deliver the images? Is it a web posted URL? Right, so OpenAI gives you two things. It gives you URLs that are good for an hour. So, you know, use them or lose them, download them or lose them. And you can also download the image directly as with base 64. You can download, you can just download the image and be done. So either way. And uh, that, what is a considered image? Like for instance, that I asked for an SVG on this API? That's a good question. No, you can't. Um, it generates paints. Um, so you, which it's not a bad idea as like an original, but I actually, I need to update this module. This is weird because I helped create the ping file specification, but it's not appropriate for <laughs> photographic images, totally inappropriate for deploying them on the left. It's good for like intermediate storage because it's lossless. But so I need to add a little bit of code here that will convert them to JPEG really when I bring them down. Um, because once you put these, that's why you saw them crawling onto the screen. Normally you don't see that on a decent a decent office there.
Good question. Any other have a question, Mr. Foss? In that case, thank you very much. I'm going to call it there. I'll go ahead, Alice.